Good morning, everyone. It is a fairly gray and rainy morning if you are watching live from the Northeast United States. But luckily for the next 20 minutes or so, we have an artwork to look at together. If this is your first time watching an Art in Focus, welcome. I am Dr. Michelle DeMarzo, the Curator of Education and Academic Engagement at the Fairfield University Art Museum. And our Art in Focus programs are an opportunity to spend 20 or so minutes looking together at a single work of art. And this is our subject for today, this 14th century ivory diptych, which is generously on loan to the Fairfield University Art Museum from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And if you've watched any other of these um, online virtual art and focus events, you know that I have been taking the opportunity to select objects that would present a little bit more of a challenge if we were meeting in person. So I'll just show you, if you visited the Bellarmine Hall galleries of the museum, you would find the Met diptych in this case with other objects that are on loan to us uh, generously from the Metropolitan. And you can see that you would be possible using the windows on either side of the case to get a little bit of a sense of this object in its three-dimensional form, but it is very small. So this gives it a sense of scale. Uh, if we were sitting in a semicircle on our sort of uncomfortable stools, it wouldn't be so easy to get as close a look at it as we're able to do through the medium of digital images and Zoom. So here we are. Uh, this, this is a wonderful object, a wonderful little object was what I was about to say. And of the glimpse that I just gave you of this object in the case, the fact that we're looking at it and seeing it as two pieces of ivory connected by hinges, and you can see a clasp on either side, might quickly give you the impression that this is something that moves, it's hinged. And in fact, the name diptych refers not at all to what is being depicted here in the ivory, but it's just a generic descriptor of the type of object that it is. So the prefix di meaning double, uh, if it was a triptych, for example, it would have three wings, but a diptych is just a two-piece hinged object. Uh, a diptych can be very large and they can be very small. And it just so happens that ours is extremely small. You can see the dimensions there are listed four inches across when it's closed, eight inches across when it's opened. So you can think of it in a very real sense as palm-sized. We're looking at an object that was intended to be held in the hands an object for personal devotion. So where are we in the world and in time? We're in France, it's the 14th century. Christianity is the dominant religion, though not the only religion throughout Europe. And Christian devotion means many things depending on what social class you are in. The object that we're looking at did not belong to someone of the laboring class. This is an elite object, which we know just by virtue of the kind of material out of which it is made. So this is a carved ivory object. In fact, I'll show you when it's closed, and these are two photographs showing from either side from the Metropolitan's website. You can definitely see the striations um, on the cut side of the ivory, giving you a sense of a, of a tusk. And rather marvelously, although we might assume that this would be elephant, elephant ivory, in the 13th century, there was a migration of walrus south through Europe. So walrus ivory was also a source of this very precious material. So we're looking at an object that could only have been commissioned and owned by someone at the very highest level of French society. It is a luxury object, but it's also not a unique object. This is not the only one of its kind. In fact, if you go to the Metropolitan Museum of Arts website, if you search for ivory diptych, for example, you will find that they own quite a few. Uh, they differ in format. Some of them have only two scenes on the inside. There are a number of individual leaves, one side of the diptych that has somehow become separated from its twin, sold off separately. And many of them you'll discover if you look at the credit line that tells you how did this get to the Metropolitan Museum's collection? Many of them, just like this one that is currently at Fairfield, were purchased by J.P. Morgan in the late 19th and early 20th century and gifted to the Metropolitan Museum of Art around 1917, which is when this one entered their collection. And it's been on view at Fairfield for, well, it's been at Fairfield for quite a few years. I actually don't know offhand exactly when it entered, but we are delighted to have it on view and even more delighted to have this chance to look at it virtually with all of you, again, giving us a little bit of a, a chance to get closer to it 
than we would be able to do easily in a group in person. So he said that this is an object for Christian devotion. So the person who owned this, who would have been extremely wealthy and fortunate to have such a luxury object, holding it in their hands, could open it and be greeted with this series of eight scenes drawn from the life of the Virgin Mary and also of Jesus. And what's interesting is that if we are thinking of this sort of as a book, in the West, we are accustomed to read left to right and top to bottom. But if you have been looking at the scenes that are depicted here, and importantly, if you are already familiar with the Christian narrative that it's explaining, you might be starting to realize that things aren't running exactly in the way we might expect. So the quote unquote story doesn't stop, doesn't start at the upper left of the left-hand leaf, go down that first side and then pick up again at the top. So the images don't read the same way um, we would read a printed book. So that right there is a nice reminder that things can be done differently in different times. We shouldn't necessarily expect that our practice of reading would map perfectly onto this, what is a sculptural object rather than a text? So in fact, um, if we identify the scenes, they actually start in terms of where they're located in the Christian New Testament, they start on the bottom. So on the bottom of both leaves, and we tend to call when we have a horizontal band, we call it a register. So on the bottom register of each leaf, we have scenes from the life of the Virgin Mary. It starts on the bottom left, continues bottom right, and then it moves to the upper left. And we have scenes from Jesus's passion, resurrection, and ultimately with his mother um, in heaven. So even if you didn't know, I would say a great deal about um, Gothic art, French European art of the, the Gothic period in the Middle Ages, I think you might be able to look at this sculptural object and just think, oh yeah, kind of makes me think of Gothic arches, Gothic churches. We're looking at these pointed architectural forms that frame each one of these little scenes, these vignettes. And there are in um, other little, uh, I was about to sort of point with my finger, but there are other architectural decorations, uh, this sort of trefoil, so the sort of three lobed decoration that is inside the pointed arch. There are more trefoils carved into the background above the arches. There's a quatrefoil, sort of a four leaf clover type of shape in between each of the two paired arches. All of that very familiar decorative elements that we associate with the, um, the Middle Ages, with uh, Gothic art. And especially in the very first scene, the earliest scene in our diptych is the one that appears on the left of your screen. We have the Annunciation to the Virgin Mary. So we have the Angel Gabriel. We have a swooping dove representing um, the Holy Spirit. And we have the Virgin Mary. And for me, it's really this wonderful sort of S curve in which you find Mary's body that is sort of the definitely Gothic style, that sort of elongated, very elegant, sinuous curving of the body was something that you find a great deal in representations of the human figure in this time period, specifically in French art. And this is a slightly different angle. This is also from the Metropolitan Museum's website. And I find this photograph interesting because they took it from a slightly different angle. And you can also tell they were using a different warmer temperature of light. And it's interesting to see how the material of ivory reacts with that. So these are the sort of standard images. They're taken with a cooler light straight on to the object. But when you switch to this, not only a slightly different angle, but this sort of warmth, I think it conjures the, um, sort of the sense of the material with a little bit greater tactility for me, not least because it's closer up, but because the, this very warmth of light conjures what it might feel like to warm this object up in your hands as you hold it for an extended period of time. And I also included this detail because it lets you see that S curve of Mary's body from a slightly different angle that might help you um, appreciate it a little further. But I think it's just wonderful how the sculptor has um, shaped the draperies that suggests the curve of her body under the robes and this very elegant gesture that she's making, which is echoed by Joseph in the adjacent scene. We're seeing the nativity scene. So Mary breastfeeding the infant Jesus and Joseph arriving next to her. In fact, I'll go back to these two larger versions. You can just make out two of the, um, the, the ox and um, perhaps a, a, a mule. Uh, depicted that would have been in the, the manger stall, giving us a little bit more of a sense that it's a nativity scene. 
So we move from the Annunciation to Mary on the lower left. We have um, the Nativity scene with the breastfeeding virgin on the right side of the left leaf. Moving to the right hand side of the diptych, we have the three kings who have come to pay homage to the Virgin Mary. You might notice appears to be wearing sort of a crown uh, herself in this image. And then all the way to the right, we have the presentation of Christ in the temple. So time is moving very quickly in these four representations on the bottom half of the triptych. Oh, I just called it a triptych, on the bottom half of the diptych. If we move to what is on the top register, so switching to the top side of both, now we have Jesus as an adult. So in certain sense, although Mary is present in most of these scenes, the overall thrust of the story, as is the focus of the Christian New Testament, is the coming of Jesus into the world and the sort of salvific message that this object would have been designed to guide meditation and prayer on. So it's about his the annunciation of his birth to Mary, his birth, the three kings arriving to offer him presents, him being presented um, in the temple and sort of his first step to achieving adulthood. And then we jump ahead and we are already at his passion and death in the upper register. So looking at the upper, at the left-hand side here, we have the flagellation at the column. Um, and I love the detail in the background that the sculptor has managed to etch out the what appear to be the stones of a masonry wall with a crenellated border looking like sort of teeth at the top which is a wonderful, a wonderful detail. We have the crucifixion uh, immediately to the right. And on the other half, the message turns joyful. So we go from passion and crucifixion and death immediately to resurrection. And then in the final scene at the right, we have the Virgin Mary having joined her son in heaven, being crowned uh, by an angel alongside him. So it's an incredible amount of um, sort of narrative completion that is packed into, again, what is a six by four object when closed, six by eight when open, but it really is extraordinary what this sculptor is able to accomplish in this tiny object. Whoops, I went the wrong way. So I'm gonna just bring us back to the, the full image. One of the things that is extraordinary about ivory is that it will allow for the carving of extremely detailed um, depictions, even though at the same time it is fragile. So ivory can be broken. And I would invite you to take advantage of this slightly um, tilted view to see all of the places where the shadows are hiding. Every one of those places means that the sculptor has managed to carve out this precious material to make a three-dimensional representation. When I say three-dimensional, all of these figures, we say they are in relief because they are protruding from the flat surface of the plane behind them. But the way that the sculptor was able to create these, the sense of scenes that are set back in space, where shadows gather behind the curve of those Gothic arches around, for example, in the crucifixion, around the upper, the hands of Jesus are hidden behind the arches. So to be able to create that kind of depth with this material is just really stunning. And for example, I'll also point your attention to uh, the scene of the flagellation where you can see Jesus's, his left leg behind the column to which he's tied. So that column is you know, barely connected, it's connected along his body, but at the top and at the bottom of that scene, there is space around that column where it has been carved free of the ivory behind it. So it's just extraordinary to consider a slip of um, the chisel and the column would be broken and the object you know, would have been destroyed, this incredibly precious material. So we are looking at a luxury object that bespeaks of an extraordinarily high level of skill and a correspondingly high level of sophistication on the part of the owner. I also just want to point out the, the number of sort of hanging items, um, sort of, uh, pendant items that are included. So not just the column. Over the crucifixion, we have depictions of the sun and the moon sort of hiding uh, around the trilobed interior of the arch, reminding us of the story that appears in three of the gospels that there was an eclipse at the moment of Jesus's death on the cross. Uh, there is the angel who descends to crown the Virgin Mary. 
which makes a kind of nice complement, if you follow it diagonally, to the dove who appears in the first scene, arriving to um, complete the incarnation to uh, part of the Annunciation scene. And then we have two scenes, both the um, nativity scene and also the presentation with hanging lamps, indicating that these are set in an interior. And finally, the star. Uh, that's the last one I'll point out to you, the star that's depicted in the three kings scene. And when you see one of the, the kings is gesturing up to it. Again, just the, the level of control and skill to make uh, these pendant pieces that would be so delicate, that could be so um, easily snapped off, is just really extraordinary. It also reminds us why it was so common for ivory depicted um, reliefs like this to take this form of a diptych. And I'm gonna just go back to that image because what does this form allow? It allows for protection of the object. So not only protection, but also portability. So we're looking at a small object intended to be held in the hand, but also capable of being closed, of being securely latched, and then being brought along on the travels with an owner. So it's an extraordinary object that reminds us that these things, these pieces, had lives and they might have had quite far flung, flung lives. We don't know where this particular owner might have traveled, but we know they could have brought their devotional object uh, along with them. And I will remind you that if you do have questions, uh, you're more than welcome to put them into the chat. For example, Jay Rogers just asked, what material were used to construct the hinges and the clasp? And I can only offer you the information that uh, is available from the METS website, which just says metal clasp. But I did wonder the same thing, if the clasp itself were original. I've seen no indication that in this case, it is not original to the object. Of course, as I mentioned, you will see many examples of ivory carved reliefs that have been separated from the original. So the metal clasp no longer exists. And another element of these objects that might surprise us, since I've, I've talked uh, a little bit about, I've talked a lot about this material of ivory, whether it was elephant ivory brought from Africa or walrus ivory harvested from these animals as they move south, it's a luxury material available only to the highest levels of society. So we might assume from that that they would have left sort of the purity of the surface to be admired with just the color of the ivory itself. And in fact, we know from many, um, or some, I shouldn't say many, surviving examples, including several that you can see on the Metropolitan's website, that ivory diptychs like this quite frequently were painted with quite bright colors. Now, often the paint simply doesn't survive. We're left with the underlying and very durable ivory material itself. But through certain miracles of survival and conservation, there are examples that show us that paint was used to make these scenes more legible. So we might envision, for example, um, a different color being used to coat the background of some of these individual scenes to present and to create another illusion of depth, or potentially yellow being used to highlight the star, the lamp, the sun. It is difficult for us to reconstruct, I think, always mentally, but if you are familiar with um, what has been learned in the past you know, several decades about even ancient sculpture from Greece, from Rome, we know now that they were always colored, that the white appearance of the surface, that's just time giving it to us. And that if you brought an ancient Roman or an ancient Greek forward to today and they saw their sculptures in the Met, barren of any color, they would be shocked. How are you supposed to read them without the paint that brought them to life? So it's another uh, interesting reminder, a phrase that I had just uh, been telling my students the other day, uh, the phrase that the past is a foreign country and they do things differently there. And it's so true. It applies not only to the fact they covered up this precious material with paint on their ivory diptychs, but also to what I said before, where we might expect it to read left to right, um, left to right, top to bottom, and continue on the next quote unquote page. It doesn't actually do that. You see, we have another question. Uh, Dina asked, is the placement of the order of events typical? Now, I will be honest there and say that this is far outside my particular area of expertise. So I'm only answering insofar as I have looked at other examples of these, especially at the Mets website, and there is flexibility. Um, as I said before, if you look at other examples that are available in museums like the Met, 
you'll find, for example, that not all of the diptychs, if they still survive as a pair, not all have eight scenes, for example. They might only have two. Um, and then the selection of the scenes, there is not a standard requirement of which set of scenes is depicted, no matter how many scenes are in there. Other diptychs that are in the Mets collection, for example, uh, feature more of the second coming. So they show Mary in heaven interceding on behalf of um, those who are being raised at the second judgment. They, some of them show the damnation of souls at the, the second coming. So there are other um, scenes that were commonly depicted. What the selection of scenes, who is responsible for the selection of scenes here, we don't know. How far the patron might have been involved, for example, in requesting which scenes should be, uh, should be shown is not something that I personally know. Uh, but I'm sure that especially a wealthy patron who is hiring an artist to create such a luxury object could certainly have some input in saying, I would like to see X, Y, and Z. And of course, we should always remember that the function of these was to be a guide to prayer. So the idea of connecting the lives of Mary and Jesus in this particular set of scenes does, I think, a wonderful job of sort of bringing the Christian narrative to this, to this full circle. And yet I'll point out that unlike the examples that have um, the reminder of the potential of damnation, this one ends only with the coronation of the Virgin. So it ends on this and next to the resurrection of Jesus. So it ends on an extremely, I would say, uh, triumphal note. Let's see, what other questions do we have here? Uh, Dina also asked, how would it be used and by whom? Um, so I, I think I'd addressed a little bit of that in terms of, in terms of how it would be used. Definitely held in the hands, uh, potentially also propped on a pre do so a, it's like a kneeling um, prayer bench. Who it would be used by specifically, we don't have any particular information beyond the expectation they would have been of a, of a high social class. Tyler Heffern asks, oops, just scrolled up too far. Tyler asked, do you think the artist or the patron decided which scenes to include and more importantly, which scenes to exclude? And as I said, I'm sure the patron would have had um, some capacity to suggest which scenes they would like to see uh, because if you're the one paying the bill, then it gives you a little bit of uh, authority in the negotiation, let's see. Oh, and he added, for example, in regard to the passion, why the flagellation instead of say the lamentation? And that's a great question and one that I don't think that we can answer or certainly I can answer right now. And one thing that I would do if I was interested in that is I would go looking for other examples of the surviving ivory diptychs. And I would see if a scholar has made a tally of how many, what are the most commonly depicted scenes? For example, it is no surprise that we see the crucifixion and the resurrection as depicted scenes in an object designed for devotion. But I would wonder if a scholar of French Gothic art has analyzed of the surviving objects. How frequently do we see the flagellation? How often is it the three magi as opposed to other, other scenes? Magi versus shepherds, for example. Uh, Kathy Carroll asks, I know sometimes patrons appear in paintings. Do they ever appear in carvings? Do you know? Um, that is a great question. And since you gave me the out, I will say, I don't know if they ever appear in carvings of a devotional kind. For example, um, I know in the Byzantine world, you have depictions of emperors very commonly on ivory carvings. Um, a very famous one of the Emperor Justinian, for example. But are they appearing in 14th century French Gothic uh, sculpture? That I, I have not seen any examples of it, but I don't wanna say that it doesn't exist. And Roger also adds that the resurrection reminds me of the Piero della Francesca resurrection. Um, that, although I don't have an image of the Piero della Francesca to show you, that is a wonderful and apt comparison. And in fact, I was showing this object to my husband before, um, before this, and he was surprised by the depiction of the resurrection because he thought, well, that looks to me sort of like John the Baptist, you know, holding the, the cross in that way. But if you're someone who has seen other representations of this type, you know how commonly depicted, here we are in the 14th century, in the 15th and 16th century, all throughout Europe, you'll see these depictions of the resurrected Christ with one foot coming out of a sarcophagus. And if you look closely below the sarcophagus, you have the rep a representation of um, the soldiers asleep at the tomb. So it becomes a very standard and recognizable uh, depiction. And I mentioned to my husband, I think it's true in the Piero della Francesca, that sometimes Christ holds a banner. He holds a triumphant banner with the cross instead of the cross itself. 
but that is a that is a great comparison to have made, Roger. And Dina asks, do you think there is a meaning to the hand gesture of Mary and Joseph? So I assume you're talking about in the nativity scene. Um, and I don't know exactly what Mary's hand gesture is. She seems to be holding um, the nursing the nursing baby. And oh, I'm sorry, we're talking about the hand gesture that Mary is making both in the Annunciation scene and then Joseph is making in the next scene. I would interpret it as sort of a, an inter interlocutor, I think I'm making up a word. I, it's, it's sort of a conversation gesture, showing that an interaction is going on. So in the Annunciation scene, Mary is receiving the word of God, as we know from the story, that the dove is bringing, um, the dove is bringing, it, is carrying out the incarnation in that moment she's hearing the word of god paintings often represented as a stream of words coming from the dove and the accompanying often rays of light so that symbol demonstrates her engagement with what gabriel is telling her and what the dove is doing and similarly then in the nativity scene i think joseph's gesture sort of demonstrates his engagement with what is happening so he has entered the scene, he's looking upon Mary and the nursing Jesus, and he's engaged with it in some fashion. Um, I don't necessarily have any more specific answers to give than that, I'm afraid. I don't see any other questions on this one. This one has clearly generated a lot uh, of interest, which is no surprise because there is so much to look at. And that is absolutely purposeful because even though this is you know, a luxury object, it's not something that you would get a new one of every year. Right. This is designed to support sustained looking, sustained engagement, sustained devotion. And one way um, to do that is to give the, the faithful person who's holding it to give them more to think about. You could spend um, if you were the person using this, you could focus on just one particular scene instead of taking in the whole narrative. Um, we can't I, I don't think we can speak specifically about how people, quote unquote, read these. But I'm just suggesting that because there is so much to look at, it's something that would lend itself to sort of unfolding over time as it was, as it was owned over a period of a years or a lifetime. So I hope when the museum is open again to the public, and we hope, we hope that day is coming soon, that you will visit the Bellman Hall galleries and you will take a look at this object um, in person and you'll see how small it is and you will be overjoyed to have had the opportunity to look at it in art and focus using our digital medium well, we will look forward to seeing you at our next Art in Focus, which is in May, which is taking us to a work that's on view in the Lala Asadi show in our Walsh Gallery. And as always, if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to email me at the museum. And if I'm able to answer, I will absolutely do so. So everyone, I hope you take care and have a good rest of your day.